as somebody up front said. Good morning. Good morning. Today is the day the Lord has made, and what a glorious day it is. It's December, thank you, 16th, and they're talking 44, 41 degrees. We have snow yet. It just doesn't get any better than that, does it? Yes, I'm up because my harvest is complete. For those of you who have been asking me for two months, I ask you to keep those who still have crops out in the fields in your prayers. They are stressed, a kind of stress that we really shouldn't have this time of year. We should be focusing on the birth of our Lord, our Savior, our salvation. So let us be glad in today. I remind everyone, Wednesday the 19th, 7 o'clock, is going to be our youth Christmas program. I believe that's also Sunday school along with our youth groups. So if there's any way possible, clear your calendar, come support our youth for their Christmas program. We have the Koinonia sign-up sheet I will be passing around. You may have noticed the socks in the pews. You will be told what to do with those. Do not put them on. Okay? All right. So now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship and to praise our Lord. With the Advent candle people. Today's Advent candle lighting scripture comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Joy is at the heart of the journey through Advent to Christmas. Joy in the knowledge of what God has done throughout the ages. Joy in the realization that God is able and that God does change things for the better. Joy in the assurance that God can enter into our lives no matter what our situation might be. The Apostle Paul calls us to a life of rejoicing, to live a life full of rejoicing and gentleness, to put aside worry in the confidence that the Lord is near to lift our requests in prayer with thanksgiving, to trust that the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds. Let us then consider the condition of joy in our lives. Do worries sometimes seem larger than our confidence that God is near? Does the busyness of our lives sometimes interfere with our life of prayer? Does anxiety over the big things of the world ruin the little joys of life? Advent is a time when we can clean out the inner stables of our lives so that new life can be born, our spirits may be refreshed, and our lives may be renewed in the joy of salvation. Please join me in the candle lighting liturgy. The Lord, your God, is in your midst. Rejoicing over you with gladness, renewing you in love, I will bring you home and restore your fortunes, says the Lord. Lord. 
With joy you will draw waters from the wells of salvation. We will rejoice in the Lord always. We light a third candle to reveal the pathway to faithfulness. What is this? It is now time for the kids to come and sing. Sing a song of Christmas, just like the angels sing. Glory in the highest to the newborn king. Sing a song of Christmas throughout the silent night of the blessed Savior who came to bring us light. Sing a song of Christmas, a song of peace and joy, and the story to be told of a precious baby boy. Sing a song of Christmas, setting your thoughts apart to bring honor to the one who can dwell within your heart.
Okay, guys, get your, your basket. Lucas, you got to guard the candles. You're going to sacrifice the body for the cause. Sounds good. To Lucas's mom and dad, well, he was a great kid. Okay, come on, get down here. You got to spread out. Hey, you get kids, get back here. Does anybody throw a fastball like Randy Johnson? I don't think you guys are big enough. Yeah, okay, we're safe. Now spread out, spread out. Okay, okay. You got a few words? Oh, no. There you go. Throw them up. Hey, bad throw. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> no! Beam ball! <laughs> Good shot, Kyler. Point set us took a beating. <laughs> okay, let's finish it up. <laughs> we got socks, we got underwear. All right. Um. Yay. It looks like everybody had a good time, and what a wonderful bunch of socks and underwear. If anybody forgot to bring theirs, we'll leave that box out there under the tree until close to the first of the year, and then all this will be taken to Open Door Mission. Thank you, everyone. Okay, guys. Just leave it right up here. Here, just right here. We got to keep that aisle. Okay. Thank you, one and all. What an experience. That was exhilarating. All right. That was fun. Since you did so well, let's watch a video.
little town of Bethlehem. Good morning. Would you please stand for the reading of the gospel, which is Luke 3, 7 through 18. Crowds of people came out to John to be baptized by him. You snakes, he said to them, who told you that you could escape from the punishment God is about to send? Do those things that will show that you have turned from your sins, and don't start saying among yourselves that Abraham is your ancestor. I tell you that God can take these rocks and make descendants for Abraham. The axe is ready to cut down the trees at the roots. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. The people asked him, what are we to do then? He answered, whoever has two shirts must give one to the man who has none, and whoever has food must share it. Some tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what are we to do? Don't collect more than is legal, he told them. Some soldiers also asked him, What about us? What are we to do? He said to them, Don't take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely. Be content with your pay. People's hopes began to rise, and they began to wonder whether John perhaps might be the Messiah. So John said to all of them, I baptize you with water. But someone is coming who is much greater than me. I am not good enough even to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit with fire. He has his winnowing shovel with him to thresh out all of the grain and gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn the chaff in a fire that never goes out. In many different ways, John preached the good news to the people and urged them to change their ways. This is God's good news. You may be seated. If I happen to lose my sight, it's because a pair of socks hit me in the head and I'm suffering. I doubt it. No pun intended, but John seems to be having a bad hair day, or he's about to have a bad hair day. Because what kind of preacher starts their sermon out by saying, you brood of vipers? Oh, that felt good. I won't do it again. Most preachers today know that's not the way you begin a sermon. But what John could have done to kind of ease that sting of being called, calling his congregation, the people who have gathered around here, a brood of vipers was... There's an exercise called the critique sandwich. What the critique sandwich is, you give a positive, then you give a negative, then you give a positive, like, hey, Bernie, you're looking good today, but you're going to go a long ways in the world, aren't you, Bernie? That's positive. We didn't go into the negative, but there's another positive there. But John didn't do that. And that leaves us with one thing that is for sure. And that is we would never have John in our employment or on our staff or on our volunteer personnel. I mean, could you imagine you know, having John around and, and Marty calls and says there's a family and we need to talk and with the family and get ready for a funeral service and John walks in and says, you brood of vipers. Ooh. Or a pair of newlyweds planning their special day and here comes John and calls them a brood of vipers. We got to admit that John is such a captivating figure, and that's, uh, that's uh, putting it mildly. To be chosen as the one to prepare the way of God's entrance into the world. Once again, we may be asking ourselves, as we did last week, what was God thinking? You know, it's pretty hard to find any trace of grace in John's troubling talk of jub judgment. One of the names for his preaching style is called Viper Theology. Viper Theology is where the preacher spews venom that scares, shocks, bites, and stings the congregation. Another name for John's preaching 
style, and we may be more familiar with it, is hellfire and brimstone preaching. You know, good old tent revival preaching. No matter what you may call John's preaching style, if you haven't noticed, John is not trying out to be Mr. Nice Guy. He's not concerned about building a fan base or having a following or full fo- or, 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 or forming a political base. He's not paid to preach, nor does he live off what the Baptists call a love offering. However, John isn't showing much love today, but he sure does tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth about the gospel. He's a weirdo from the wilderness. We discussed that last week. That's why we asked, why is God, what is God doing? But he has the word from the Lord. A word that judges and a word that saves. A judging word, a saving word. A word that makes you say, ouch, but also brings in an amen. Proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John does not mince his words. His introduction gets the crowd's attention, and it should get our attention also. John is serious for serious times, and he wants his listeners to know that if they miss his message, they miss the whole point of following God and preparing the way for the Lord. So the question becomes, how do we prepare the way of the Lord as we anticipate the advent, the coming of God? John proclaims a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, a double theme that runs throughout Scripture. We repent, God forgives. This is symbolized each Sunday that we, especially the first Sunday of each month, each Sunday where we have a prayer of confession. And then we have words of assurance. Repentance with the expectation of God's forgiveness. According to John, to prepare the way of the Lord, repentance is critical. But repentance during Advent? Isn't this the season to be jolly? Isn't it? Hope and expectation are usually stressed during Advent. But we shouldn't forget that remorse is also fitting in this holy season. As the eyes of our hearts turn to God, we repent of what we've done and what we have left undone, our sins of commission and our sins of omission. In the light of his coming, we see ourselves for who we really are in the darkness. Thus we repent. But John takes it one step farther. He links the remorse of repentance to holy action. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. The crowds come out to be baptized, to wade in the water. But he tells them that the rite of baptism, the rite of cleansing, purification, and repentance is linked to the righteous living that Jesus Christ will teach the people. He doesn't cheap, he doesn't preach cheap grace. Where you say a prayer of confession, be assured by the words of the pastor, and then go home and watch football. But rather, John suggests that true repentance is when a repentant life reveals itself through right living and action. Bear fruits of worthy repentance, John says. The people who have gathered ask John, what should we do? John replies, That if you have two coats, give your abundance. Give the extra coat to the open door mission or someone who may need it. Or take it to some place where it can be passed on to someone in need. Then we hear from those who are at the rock bottom of the personality chain in Israel, the tax collectors. They ask, what should we do? And John replies, only collect what you are supposed to collect. Quit oppressing the people for your own personal monetary gain. Next, we have the soldiers. 
We don't know if they are the Roman soldiers, Herod's death squads, or temple soldiers. But it doesn't make any difference. They harass and bully the people. Then they rob, extort, and steal. They ask, what should we do? John's plain and simple answer is, stop. Learn to live off what you make and leave the people alone. So what should we do? So we throw socks and underwear in the middle of a church service. We gather items for in-gathering kits. We use our aid and assistance money to help a family who has lost everything in a fire. We provide food for the body and food for the soul for our youth group on Wednesday nights. We also provide food for the body and soul for our men's prayer breakfast. Plus, there is our continual commitment to the food pantry and our contributions of items to help feed the people in the Oakland area. This is Advent, and that is what we are supposed to do. Yes, it is a part of our Advent message to not only give gifts to each other in celebration of our Savior's birth, but also to those who are not as fortunate as we are. When we are baptized, we die the death to live to the life. We, the baptized, fulfill our baptismal covenant with God whenever we bear fruits worthy of repentance, no matter what the season is. We're not a seasonal people or third Sunday of the month people. We are an everyday people. It is our identity and it is our lifestyle. Baptism is our covenant with God that we are not only live a life we have committed to, but bear fruit of that life. If you should ever ask, what should we do? I think you already know what to do. Grab a pair of socks or a package of tidy whities, a toothbrush, a tube of toothpaste, fill a flood bucket, make an ingathering kit, or respond to the needs of others in any shape or form when the need arises. Jesus came to show us the way, and now it is our commitment to the one who raised us from the dead to show the way. That's what we shall do. That's what we shall do. And as my youngest daughter says, we shall, we shall, we shall, won't we? And with that I say, amen. Let us sing Away in a Manger. All right. Thank you. Any joys or concerns this morning? Um, some of you might remember Mike and Emily Christian, who's Christensen, who used to live here. Um, Emily's dad passed away this week, and his funeral is tomorrow in Decorah. Mm-hmm. So if you keep them in your prayers. It's Baylor's birthday this week. You mean you couldn't get You mean you couldn't get her to talk? What's going on back there? Uh, Grandma Jessie broke her wrist uh, last week. She had surgery on Friday, and she's doing pretty good. So. Okay. Uh, we'd like to keep Daryl Henningson in our prayers. He had a stroke sometime this past week. I don't know any particulars about it, um, but he's in Texas. So keep him in our prayers and our his doctors. Uh, I would also like to invite all of you to the uh, community band concert at Iowa Western Arts Center this afternoon at 3. There's no charge, and there's wonderful Christmas and holiday music. I just want to express my joy that my husband is done harvesting. (laughs) 
Um, I know that it was mentioned earlier, we do have the kids' Christmas program this Wednesday. We're doing a little different this year so that we can involve the youth group too. Um, we have several youth group members for junior high and high school that do not normally attend church. And so this is a great opportunity for them to um, share what they are learning and what they feel with others. So if you have a chance to come, we would love to have you. If anyone has some open hands and a free time beforehand, um, to help feed the crew and to get them dressed in costumes. That'll make things a little bit quicker and easier. Anyone else? Well, I can't um, not say what a joy it is to have a college son home, um, which makes me think that we're all probably joyful for all those college kids that are home in our family. Um, I'm also glad to have my friend here to, who doesn't always show up with us, <clears throat> but Deb is like <clears throat> a sister and aunt to the kids, so it is very special. So when I started sitting here thinking of that, it was hard not to say that we also need to be um, thinking of those who don't have those opportunities and to keep them in our prayers during the holiday season. Amen. Anyone else? Well, let us gather in heart and mind for prayer. Oh, sweet Jesus, you have blessed us. I just gaze upon all these socks, all these packages of underwear. It is a great day. We've heard the stories of the homeless who rely on those socks who may be without underwear. Life on the streets rough and we just get to put a small dent into it. And we thank you for allowing us to do this ministry. It was a little unorthodox but I think you're smiling at the congregation of Oakland United Methodist Church. It's been a good day because we did what we are called to do, to bear out and witness our, not only our faith, but our identity as to who we are. So Lord, as we leave this place, there will be six days until we meet again, unless you come to the, to come, I know you're gonna come to the uh, kids program, you know, two or three, but you just love them kids. But it's going to be six days. What kind of blessings lie in between? Who will we meet? What responses will be there for our faith? To feed, clothe, and shelter. To make somebody's life a little, little better. Not because we're just great people, but we are people who pick up their cross to follow you, Lord. We are your disciples. We are children of God. And you call us to be that day in and day out. The laborers are few. We know it. But the yoke that we carry is light. So enjoy it. It is the fruit of our repentance. So, Lord, I turn over to you the prayers of these people so that they may speak to you in their own special language. And, Lord, we pray that we take a lifetime to hear your answer. Lord, hear our prayers. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And let... 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, may the ushers come forward so that we can continue to be who we are called to be. Let us join in our prayer of thanksgiving. God of grace and love, you have asked of us so little and give so much. And we have too often missed the imbalance of our relationship with you. You have given us life and breath and the resources to meet every need. And you have asked only that we be fruitful and faithful, compassionate and just. We give our gifts this morning as a sign of our striving toward that combination of fruitful and faithful. And we do so in repentance for the many times when we have fallen short in the little that you have required. Dedicate these gifts to help build the kingdom that is your vision, not ours. Help us to celebrate this season as Christ would have us celebrate it, in love, kindness, joy, and gratitude. In your Son's holy name, we pray, amen. Okay, you may go. And our benediction is simply go. Go in the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ. Be in communion with the Holy Spirit now and forever. And with that, we all say, amen. Let us finish by singing, Sing We Now of Christmas. Mm -hmm.